Biostat Squid. This is part 3 of a 4 video series on the differences between UMAP, TSNE and PCA. Today we will be covering part 3, UMAP easily explained. So if you're ready, let's dive in. Before we dive into UMAP, let's go over a few key concepts. We'll be working with an example dataset, a single cell dataset with the gene expression of 10,000 genes across 50,000 cells. Sometimes we want to visualize big datasets like this one in a plot, for example, to identify clusters of cells that group together because they have a similar gene expression profile. In other words, cells from the same cell type or cell identity. To do that, we introduce the concept of dimensionality reduction, by which we convert a multidimensional dataset with many thousands of genes into two variables we can plot. Obviously, when we reduce the number of dimensions, we're going to lose information, but the idea is to preserve as much of the dataset's structure and characteristics as possible. We already explained two-dimensionality reduction algorithms, PCA and TSNE, and today we'll cover UMAP, Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. In a nutshell, UMAP is another dimensionality reduction technique similar to TSNE, but it's often faster and can better preserve global structure while still focusing on local relationships. Just like TSNE, UMAP tries to take the high dimensional data and map it into a lower dimensional space, usually 2D or 3D, so we can visualize it. It does this by preserving both local and global structures, meaning it tries to keep clusters of cells close together, but also respects the overall organization of the data. So in our single cell RNA-seq dataset, we would be able to distinguish five main clusters of our main cell types, and you can see how lymphoid cells, B cells and T cells, cluster together because they are similar immune cells. So we have a nice global organization of the data, but also cells with very similar gene expression profiles clustered together. If you look closely enough, you might be able to subcluster the T cell cluster into CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells, for example. So let's dig in a bit into the maths behind UMAP without talking about the maths behind UMAP. So first, I'd like to talk about manifold learning. UMAP is based on the idea that high dimensional data often lies on a lower dimensional manifold, which is like a curved surface. For example, a 3D object might look like a 2D surface if we zoom in close enough. UMAP tries to learn this manifold structure, but instead of doing it from 3 dimensions to 2, it does it from 10,000 genes to 2 UMAP projections. But the idea is the same. So UMAP needs to construct a high dimensional graph first. So it starts by creating a fuzzy graph, which is a high dimensional graph where each data point, in this case, each cell, is connected to its nearest neighbors. So how does UMAP decide whether two cells are connected? We'll talk about this high dimensional fuzzy graph in just a bit. But for now, just know that with this multidimensional graph, UMAP ensures that local structure is preserved in balance with global structure. This is a key difference and advantage over TSNE. Okay, but this fuzzy graph is still highly dimensional. We need to bring it down to 2D. So UMAP will optimize the graph into lower dimensions. Again, like TSNE, there's an optimization step where UMAP optimizes the layout of a 2D graph, trying to keep the connections it computed in the multi-D fuzzy graph as closely as possible. Mathematically, it is different to TSNE. TSNE uses probability distributions. UMAP uses a technique from topology, the study of shapes, to optimize the graph into a lower dimensional space. So the idea of this step is to keep the local neighborhood relationships, the connections between cells, while also trying to preserve the broader global relationships in the data. 
So in essence, UMAP is very similar to TSNE. They both use algorithms to arrange data in low dimensional space. This said, UMAP does a better job at finding a balance between emphasizing local versus global structure and is much faster than TSNE. So anyways, as a result, for each cell in our dataset, we get two UMAP embeddings or coordinates. Nice. So let's talk a bit more about that fuzzy graph. How does UMAP construct a high dimensional fuzzy graph? First, we position our cells in the multidimensional space according to their expression of their 10,000 genes. Obviously, we cannot visualize this, but let's imagine it looks like this. Then UMAP basically draws a radius from each point or cell and then connects points where there is an overlap. As you can see, the radius really matters when it comes to deciding whether two cells are connected or not. Notice that the radius is chosen locally, meaning that each cell has a different radius. I'll explain how UMAP chooses a radius for each cell in just a second. But in a third step, UMAP makes the graph fuzzy by decreasing the probability that two cells are connected as the radius grows. If you check the pink cell in the middle, it's connecting with high probability with the pink and orange cells, which overlap with the smaller radius, and it is connected with lower probability with the blue and green cells, which overlap with a much bigger radius. Finally, UMAP makes sure that each point is connected to at least its closest neighbor. Now, remember perplexity in TSNE. Well, UMAP has two hyperparameters that control the results you get. The most important parameter is n neighbors, which controls how much of the local versus global structure is preserved. How does it do that? When building the initial high dimensional graph, UMAP sets a different radius for each cell to determine which cells are connected versus not. It bases the size of the radii on the distance to each cell's nearest nth neighbor. This way, all cells are approximately connected to the same number of neighboring cells. So, for example, if you choose two neighbors, the radii would look something like this. If you set n neighbors to four, it might look like this. Now, please don't take this figure as mathematically correct. It's only for visualization purposes and, you know, the radii and the connections are not entirely connect, uh, correct. But what's important to understand here is that the larger the number of the hyperparameter in neighbors is, the larger radii, so more connections between cells. Notice that the probability of those connections, depicted by the shade of grey, decreases as we connect cells that are further away. What does this mean for our final plot? Ultimately, the effect is what we already mentioned before. Low in neighbors means local relationships are preserved, meaning cells that are very similar to each other will cluster together. High in neighbors means the clustering might not be as tight, but we focus more on global relationships between cells in our dataset. Easy. The second parameter you need to be aware of in UMAP is min dist, which is the minimum distance between points in the low dimensional space. So we're not talking about the fussy graph anymore. We're talking about our 2D projections. The effect has more to do with how you visualize the relationships we already computed. As you can imagine, when we reduce the minimum distance between points, UMAP will make cells cluster more tightly together. If you increase min dist, the cells will space out. So we're focusing more on the global structure of the dataset. You can play around with these parameters and how they affect the 2D UMAP plot by visiting this web page. It's really cool. You have a 3D woolly mammoth skeleton made up of points colored by their location in space and the UMAP projection of those points, which you can alter based on the parameters. It also has a beautiful comparison between TSNE and UMAP, so highly recommend it. But back to our UMAP. This is a very important point. Running UMAP with different parameters can give you very different plots. Which one is right and which one is wrong? 
Remember that the purpose of UMAP is to be able to visualize your data. So the number of neighbors allows you to control what's important to you in that visualization. Do you prefer to be able to distinguish between different T cell subtypes? Or do you prefer a clear general overview of all the cell types in our data set? Nice, so we've gone through PCA, TSNE, and UMAP, three popular techniques for dimensionality reduction. All three methods are great options for our main problem, visualizing a large multidimensional data set with many genes. So which one to choose? What are the exact differences between them? In my next video, we will cover differences between PCA, TSNE, and UMAP, and when to use each one of them. Squid-tastic. Hope you found this UMAP explanation clear and simple. Let me know if you did by giving me a thumbs up or leaving me a comment down below. If you're looking for a more mathsy explanation of UMAP, check out some links and resources on biostatsquid.com. Remember to subscribe if you don't want to miss any more videos from me. Have a squid-tastic day and see you in the next one.